Thank you very much, David, for introduction. Thank you, everybody, for um, accepting my invitation and coming um, in the middle of the week. Um, it's about uh, one year that um, uh, after recognition of this project, which was a, one of the best projects that uh, we have done, it's all about sustainability, and it was recognized by RIBA. We, we were lucky to win a few awards. One of them was sustainability. Since then, I really started putting my mind around um, sustainable development and globalization. And I always think that we, I feel like being an infant in sustainability, trying to just get out of the shell. I think there are lots of energies around us that we are not harnessing, and there are lots of energy that we are wasting around us. So how can we just uh, do something about it? And um, after that, I started thinking about uh, doing something more and returning something back. After, once you do your education, you find a job, you find a wife, family, all the basics are sorted. Then you start thinking about what else, what is next? What is this life about? And a few days ago, I was just um, looking at uh, social networking, and then I saw some quotes uh, which I thought it could be a good opener for opening this talk. And it was talking about ignorance. And it was adding different things to ignorance. It was saying, like, ignorance plus money is corruption. Ignorance plus religion is terrorism. Ignorance plus freedom is chaos. So every, what I'm trying to say is ignorance plus everything is... A, ignorance plus power is tyranny. And I can just even make up something now. Ignorance plus science could be global warming. So what I'm trying to say is if ignorance is our problem, then education is the key. And it seems that it's not, it's not an easy fight, it's an easy battle. Ignorance is a fundamental part of every human being, and I believe that so. Uh, to the point that I would just say perhaps life is nothing but a journey from ignorance to enlightenment. From, um, So, um, ignorance is the fundamental part of um, human being, and we have to just go, human being is ignorant, and our life is about a journey out of this ignorance. And that's why I came to education. But what I want to mention about, you might just ask, why Sistan and Baluchistan? First of all, I have to say I've got nothing to do with Sistan and Baluchistan in terms of my own relatives or working there or I don't even know anybody in my own family to have even been in Sistan and Baluchistan. What brought me to that is bringing, putting that charity hat, sustainability hat, I thought, what should I do? What can I do? Um, what can we do, basically? So... Um, I thought that if we want to just do something with better, we focus on our own countries. I consider myself as an immigrant, and I think there are many Iranians here that have been here for different years, somebody less, somebody more. But at the end of the day, we are immigrants, and we are perhaps the lucky one that who has managed to come to a developed country and we are benefiting from the good education, good medicine and everything. So if you want to just help for education, would you come and help education somebody to educate in this country? I'm sure that's very good. And actually David has done it. The Seckford House Trust that we formed last year started his scholarship and we actually, David, very... Um, in a generous way, he's just uh, helping lots of the local students. I thought maybe I need to just take one step further, take it out, make it global. Just focus back on my own country. 
And if, let's, let's see it as one model, because many of these, uh, you, many of you are here, you already have done a charity work, foundation work, and I just want to basically take your advice. Just see me as a new soldier who wants to just think out of the box. If we Iranian try to just do something, we'd better put our force together and just go back and do something for Iran. And it could be an example for every immigrant. You are Syrian, you are Libyan, you are Australian, you're whoever you are. If all of the people who've got some surplus, they've got a, they are a taxpayer, and they, they want to do something for the world and be a force. If you just come together and do something for your own country, this is, I think, this is the best, um, the best influence that we can make will come out of that. So why Sistan Baluchistan again? Sistan Baluchistan has got few things which, to me, is the best candidate. For, uh, for help. First, is the poorest part of Iran, by far the poorest from any other poor part of Iran. That's one thing. The second thing, it seems that Sistan and Baluchistan is, has been in the blind spot of every central government that has ruled Iran. It's not about the Islamic Republic of Iran and its mismanagement in the last 40 years. It's not about um, Pahlavi before that. It's it seems that all dynasties, they have completely forgotten that there is 11% of the land of Iran is Sistan and Baluchistan. It's a forgotten place. It's you, when you walk there, it's a place that even the government today, when they want to exile somebody, they would send it to this province of Sistan and Baluchistan. So it is the poorest. Mismanaged and then desertification, it is just ruining this province by it's the closest closest province to mass immigration and these are the information I took before I decide to just go and see things with my eyes because if I want to talk one day to people to just about charity there are lots of arguments against charity what is the overhead who are you helping are you sure where the money goes who's going to use it I thought I have to go and see it with my own eyes. And I just had a journey to this place, um, helped by a few organizers that um, they were studying in universities of Tehran. They kindly took me there. I was there for a week. And I stayed from Baluch family to Baluch family. And it was a um, very valuable, va valuable journey to there. And I saw that how poor these people are. They don't have, and if I just want to bring down the main problems is, first of all, is the school. They don't have a school. The average education in this province is end of primary school. This place, all of the boys are smugglers, <laughs> technically speaking. If they are coming from a good family, they are smuggling fuel, fossil fuel like petrol and gas. And if they are not very lucky with the family, they are smugglers of drugs. And I don't blame them. And I do not blame them because when you don't have school, when you are seven years, when you are ten years old, where would you go? You don't have a job, you don't have a school. They have to make money. This is if you are a boy. If you are a girl, perhaps you would, by the age of 11, you would be the third or the fourth wife of a man in your tribe. And I said tribe because it's a very conventional structure, social structure there, and still uh, there are lots of tribes there. So my journey there is what I have done so far, which I, want, I will talk a little bit more about it after the documentary. I will go a little bit more into the details, what I have done and uh, what can be done for this place. Um, to just put things a little bit in the context, um, I thought maybe we just show a 19 minutes documentary, and after that I will have another short talk before, before we just go to Charlie. So thank you for your um, patience, and uh, if you don't mind, we just start watching. Now, say what we want to do here in Sekford House Trust. Um, there is a place here, Sarbaz. This is the, if, this province is the most deprived part of Iran. This section is the most deprived part of this province. 
I had a journey. I went to Chabahar, and then we just went with our friends. We went all the way to the end of Sarbaz, and then we went to Zahedan, driving there, and we just came back to Tehran. So this is the location that we chose. Peoples and communities. They were. If you go to the next picture, just to show, um, this is suburban of Chabahar, which is quite a strategic place. It's. Um, Maybe one day we would talk about Chabahar in a different subject. It's going to be the new Silk Road, perhaps, in future. But it's not, it's not relevant at the moment. These people are, immigration has started. So from all of those sections, you're coming to suburban of Chabahar, which is the only developed part of this place. Um, I just took this photo. This man is just, they are making temporary houses around. And this is a high voltage cable. The guy is just cutting it to bring it to his own house. And I thought, this is, this is crazy. <coughs> kapar. This is what they call it. The, this you see it a lot. They call it kapar, these type of houses in Baluchistan. But, but one of the things that I like to just mention here, this, this forgotten place is actually has got a very fertile land. And these are the different type of fruits that you can just, this is a farmer that I met on the way, and he showed me how fertile it is. Um, it's, there was a, uh, air conditioning and it was leaking in one of the houses. The leak from the air conditioning just had made the, 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 the earth green, so there were some plants growing as a result of the leak. So it's interesting. There, in terms of the landscaping, you have Oman Sea, and then after that, a desert starts. And this is a kind of a paradoxical of nature. You've got sea, and you've got desert. So, so go ahead. It's, um, well, I thought just that once you see a cat in this size, you know, you know that there is some serious shortage of food. Um, it, this is a dam that has been built. Uh, unfortunately, this is one of the examples of the mismanagement. We had this wave of building dams in, in all around Iran to just collect the water, but they are not releasing. There, there is no water behind the dam, basically. So, this is an English teacher. Um, I was living in his house. He took me to his uh, classroom. That's fine. So it's just uh, just a quick example of his just ING teaching ING. And this is one of the schools that we just met, um, and we just, um, those are, all of those kids are living in this little school. If you can go to the next one, next please. And this is, this is a kapar, I went to inside the kapar, and there are six classes. So they have six classes inside this. So they are teaching class one to the, somebody. Next year they're teaching class two, class three, class four, class six. That's how they, and it's all, this is the school there. So very close to this, we want to basically, people just um, um, allowed us to have 2,000 square meter of land. And um, they just basically gave it as a gift to the Ministry of Education in Iran, and then a donor comes and just make an agreement with the Ministry of Education, and the donor will pay about two-thirds of it, one-third will be paid by the government, and the land is provided by the local people. That's the arrangement for the school that we want to build, and hopefully next September, Mehma, um, which is the day one, we, just, we, we are planning to just open it for the next um, calendar year. Um, this is one of the schools that they are building in, in other parts, so just wanted to show that there are contractors that are building schools, and I'm using one of those contractors who has built five schools in the same region and the regions around. Next. Next. And um, this, this gentleman was just the head of the province a few days after I left. He was, he was just changed. But now I know I've been in contact with all of the people. The school development of the province, of the region, 
of the capital Tehran and um, Ministry of Education in different parts and we just um, where we are now we want to just build this school about just having a rough idea the cost will be something around 55,000 pounds and um, basically the, um, I want to just do that David he, won't, he would, I'm sure he would just help me to just do that. And if anybody wants to just do any contribution, please let us know. We just um, got all of the plans. We've got the drawings. We've got the contractor. We've got all of the parties ready to sign and to just, um, and I myself, I would just want to supervise it. And I don't, to be honest, I really, I really don't want to have any talk show. I want to just go from point A to point B. It's, it's, um, that's the reason of just making all of those uh, journey. But just the last things before going to Charlie, talking about this school is very important, but many of these villages came to me and say, we need water before, before a school. So this such a basic thing is education, but these people have a serious water crisis. We cannot be practical about doing anything in Sistan Baluchistan unless we have a very good sustainable plan to what to do with this climate, with this water crisis. Before I go there, I was looking at all sustainable solutions that you might find to just, um, to just like what we did here in Seckford, heating and cooling is like a byproduct of each other. Can we just do something with the sea and with this climate? And I just came across a company called Seawater Greenhouse. I contacted the managing director and actually to my surprise I said I want to go to uh, Middle East and I want to just see if there is any sustainable solution. It seems that you, are, you have a very innovative technology for that and um, the gentleman he just actually said w where, where are you going to Middle East and I said I want to go to Chawaha first and then to the province of Sistan Baluchistan and he said he actually has been there few weeks before me, he himself has been there. And he had a few meetings with the Energy Ministry of Energy in Iran, and he actually introduces them ideas there, but they did not return the contact. Maybe they have got the idea, I don't know. But um, anyway, this is, uh, this is, I think, is a convenient time to introduce uh, Charlie Payton, the managing director of uh, greenhouse, uh, seawater greenhouse, and he would explain more what we can do with um, this type of climate in this region. Thank you very much.